In 1980, the original Honda Accord was an interesting novelty. An excellent car, simply too small to be considered mainstream among a car-buying public used to cutlasses and caprices. By the year 2000, the tables had turned completely. The Accord and Toyota Camry had grown to become the undisputed gold standards among family cars, while their American-branded competitors had withered into lackluster also rans. But somewhere along the way, about 1990, there was a fleeting moment when the Honda Accord versus the Ford Taurus was actually a game worth watching. Here, in excellent condition with few mechanical deficiencies despite 289,000 miles of use, Representing the final and most fully-fledged form of the fourth-generation Honda Accord is a 1993 Accord EX wagon. Known as the CB Accord, this body style ran from 1990 to 1993. Simple yet distinctive, with uncommonly good craftsmanship and design, this car was a ground-up, resource-intensive, engineering-led throwdown of a new car design mounted by the Honda Motor Company at the height of Japan's economic boom. It and the Taurus were locked in a heated battle for best-selling car in America. This Accord took home the title for half of the years that it was on sale, and the other half went to the Taurus. Its red-hot popularity with 417,000 sales in 1990 was a high watermark that never has and never will be matched by any generation of Accord. In fact, while the Accord's been one of the most popular cars in America for the better part of 40 years now, this was the only generation ever to be the number one bestseller for more than one year. Those two years would be 1990 and 1991 to be exact. And although this model didn't go on sale until midway through 89 for the 1990 model year, it deserves at least some of the credit for 1989. The year that the Accord made history as the first car from a foreign nameplate ever to be the U.S. sales champion. Honda had long been building cars with excellent build quality and driving dynamics. Now, there was a car that was as much a Honda as ever, but finally big enough and comfortable enough to strike the heart of the American car market. Now, those qualities that the imports had been prized for were accessible, they were practical, they were democratized. The Accord for decades underwent a process of periodic molting, shedding its skin to reveal a bigger, better, and more United States-centric version of itself. And this model was certainly no exception as it scaled up by roughly 400 pounds and 5 inches length over its predecessor. This market increase in size meant that unlike most revisions of the Accord, which carried over at least some technology from the predecessors, this machine was all new from the inside out. You wouldn't necessarily know it though. This car is immediately placeable as an Accord as it shares a number of styling cues with both its predecessors and successors, but it bears a particularly striking resemblance to the 86 to 89 third generation Accord that directly preceded it. In fact, if it weren't for the older model's pop-up headlights, the two might be hard to tell apart. Honda was careful to carry as much of that car's styling forward as possible, from the low hood and belt line to the big windows and overall side profile. Subtle details, like the appearance and placement of its badges, and the design of its hubcaps, changed only incrementally. The continuity of the Accord's trademark appearance was a key to its success. Yes, because the Accord had always been considered attractive, so why change a good thing? but also because it was good branding. This car did a lot to cement what the name Accord stood for in the heads of the American public. Standing here with it, you can begin to sense why its appeal was so universal. This car is attractive in a natural way. Its shape and its proportions are fundamentally good. The size and shape of each body panel, each pillar, and each window feel appropriate. If this car seems to fit together well, that's no coincidence. After all, while most cars are to various degrees, cobbled together out of corporate parts bins, the Accord and all of its parts were designed together in harmony as one package. And that comes through from the moment you lay eyes on it. The lines of the Accord's body, like several other cars released around 1990, strike a fine balance between angular and soft. It's not severely boxy like many 80s cars, nor is it a shapeless lump like many later 90s models. Natural good looks meant that the Accord didn't have to rely on visual gimmickry. Instead, its handsome figure is finished tastefully, with light to moderate applications of chrome, plastic body molding, and sheet metal creases. The flush-mounted glass gives the body a sleek, modern look. The design of these EX alloys is understated, but nicely detailed. These wheels look like they belong on an expensive car. 
This car has been resprayed its factory color, Seattle Silver, a good general purpose shade so ubiquitous on CB Accords that to me it almost feels like a default. The front and rear end treatments are more defined and complex than on later Accords, and I love that about this particular model. By the way, while this car is a 1993, and the Accord received refreshed front and rear end styling for 1992, you'd be hard pressed to distinguish this car from an earlier one from the outside. That's because up front, this car's owner replaced the bumper assembly with a 1990 version because he preferred it, and in back, the wagon, which itself wasn't introduced until the 1991 model year, never received the updated taillights that the Accord sedan and coupe did. This is easily one of the most attractive wagons of its day. The cargo area of the Taurus, for instance, looked long and bulbous, and the Camry looked downright bizarre. But this wagon's trapezoidal side glass and rakish rear glass fit in neatly and don't disrupt the sedan's lines at all. You do pay somewhat of a price for those good looks though. While the extra volume and big rear hatch make the Accord much more practical, it still wasn't up with the Taurus, Camry, or Volvos as far as maximum cargo capacity. Those cars were a little bigger. In fact, while all of those cars, as well as, for instance, the Chevy Lumina, Mazda 626, and Nissan Maxima, were classified by the EPA as mid-size cars, the Accord was not. The Accord, despite having grown substantially, still trailed all of those cars in interior volume by just enough to get squeezed into the EPA's compact car segment. However, consumers, Honda, and the automotive press basically all considered this Accord to compete with those so-called mid-size cars. And in one very important regard, this car was right up there with the Camry and Taurus. Price. This Accord, despite being a mainstream model from a mainstream brand, cost what larger mainstream models from other mainstream brands cost. Now, Honda had a laser focus on building the best four-cylinder front-wheel drive cars in the industry. Honda was not all about building big cars. So when even this, their largest model, wasn't quite up to the size standards Americans were used to, Honda was driving a tough bargain. Honda was saying, hey, you could buy that Taurus. Or, for the same money, you could have this. Yes, it's smaller. No, it doesn't have a V6. But this is a driver's car. A car that oozes good craftsmanship. A car that holds your attention. And the fact that we, as Americans, a culture that places such a premium on size, took this bargain from Honda at a time when fuel prices were at an almost historic low, should tell you something. When this car first topped the sales charts, it was a major inflection point in the Japanese takeover of the American car market. The CB Accord found its success through simplicity. For instance, in very typical Honda fashion, this car had no standalone factory options. You had three choices, body style, automatic or manual, and trim level. This made shopping simpler and lowered manufacturing costs, allowing resources to be focused elsewhere. While the Accord SE appeared for 1991 and 1993 as a limited time only special edition, generally speaking, the Accord came as a DX, LX, or EX model. The Accord DX was rather rare and had very little equipment, not even a radio or air conditioning. The Accord LX was popular. It rectified those two concerns and added cruise control and power windows, locks, and mirrors. But this car is an Accord EX. The EX was, with the odd exception of the SE, the top of the line Accord. It came with nice stuff like a power moonroof and these 15 inch alloys, but the EX was also where you saw mechanical upgrades. For instance, this car's anti-lock brakes and rear discs were not available on lower level Accords. But the big thing that the EX bought you was this engine. Yes, it's still a 2.2 liter 4, but this version has more power than the version found in the DX and LX. And this is where you really want to have a 1992 or 1993 EX, while the 1990 and 1991 got a 5 horsepower bump over the lesser models due to an upgraded exhaust. This car has 15 horsepower more than a 93 LX due to an upgraded exhaust and intake, as well as a different camshaft. To offer the Accord not with an optional V6, but rather with an upgraded version of its standard four-cylinder engine, speaks to Honda's desire to put forth a simple, streamlined product, and to stick true to its roots. This bold design choice allowed the Accord to be designed with cohesion. The chassis, the body, the suspension, the drivetrain, the electronics, the engine bay. 
could all be designed around a fixed variable, a single, compact, lightweight engine, thus saving the Accord from costly and or weight intensive additions that would have served to mar its overall design. And although you had to go for a four cylinder if you wanted an Accord, this engine was different than most Fours Americans were used to at the time. Like virtually every major component of this car, this all aluminum fuel injected engine was all new with the introduction of this Accord, and its mission was to close the gap between itself and a V6. For starters, at 2.2 liters, it's relatively high displacement for a four cylinder. Although it revs up nicely as an overhead cam design with four valves per cylinder, Relatively long intake runners were employed in order to push the power band a little lower in the RPM range and give the car good off the line punch like Americans prefer. To this same end, the car is geared relatively low and the final drive ratio is 4.29. Smoothness, traditionally another big advantage for V6s, was improved here using a pair of counter rotating balance shafts and in automatic cars, a fluid filled two mode vacuum actuated motor mount. With the drivability of this four-cylinder approaching that of competitors V6s, the natural advantages of a nicely done four, size, weight, cost, and efficiency, were finally beginning to eclipse its natural disadvantages in the family car market. Backing up this engine were new five-speed manual and four-speed automatic transmissions. The manual was now cable shifted rather than rod shifted as in previous Accords, but most accounts report that shift fuel was still very good. This car comes with the optional 4-speed automatic. This unit is noteworthy because it holds one huge advantage over some later Honda 4-speeds, its excellent reliability record. The Accord suspension was also all new with the 1990 introduction of the CB, but like its predecessor, it was still a double wishbone design at all four corners. This market-exclusive suspension layout was becoming a trademark of the Accord, distinguishing it from its competitors. This design, inspired by Formula One race cars, is relatively costly and has far-reaching implications for the Accord, from its road manners to its appearance. For starters, double wishbones are a structurally superior skeleton to build a car's suspension out of. Whether the car is tuned softly or firmly, Double wishbones will generally buy you both better ride and handling characteristics at any point along that spectrum. A double wishbone design is physically less tall than a common McPherson strut suspension, and this is what gave the Accord its signature low, sporty hood, and by extension its low cowl line, low dashboard, low side window sills, and huge windows. On the flip side though, this suspension is laterally bulky, and this is best evidenced by the amount of suspension intrusion into the rear cargo area of this wagon. The Accord suspension is augmented by sway bars, standard at the front for all Accords and at the rear for all EX models and all wagons. Curb weight for this loaded automatic wagon was over 3,200 pounds. The Accord has an excellent reputation for reliability and the CB is exceptionally durable even among Accords. This particular car is just shy of reaching 300,000 miles on the odometer, having first been purchased by the current owner's family in the year 2000. In that time, the engine has received new valve cover, oil pan, and head gaskets. Shock absorbers are new at all four corners. Otherwise, this car is all original, and no further repairs to the engine or transmission have ever been necessary. Further proof of the CB's longevity, it is the only generation of Accord ever to have a documented example go over a million miles on the original engine. Between its high sales figures and its tenacity, the CB is still not uncommon on the roads today, even 30 years after its introduction. Just take a look at how this interior is held up. These are the original seats, and I don't believe I've ever seen cloth seats look anything like this after nearly 300,000 miles. This EX specific fabric is very soft and I like the pattern. Then there's the dashboard. This one piece soft touch unit hasn't faded, warped, cracked, or otherwise become compromised after 27 years of life in middle Georgia. For a mainstream car, the quality of this cabin's materials is very upscale. The most noteworthy flaws in here are that the rim of the steering wheel feels worn out and the driver's door upholstery is peeling off. This steering wheel does contain a driver airbag and admittedly, the non-airbag wheel from the 90 and 91 cars with its sporty shape and shiny Honda logo is a much nicer looking unit. The car's buttons and latches all feel solid and pleasing to actuate and the layout of the Accord's controls is straightforward and intuitive. The seats are firmly padded, very supportive and moderately bolstered, 
They are head and shoulders above domestic midsize car seats of the day. The front seats aren't power, saving money and weight, but you've still got comprehensive adjustments, including lumbar. The Accord gives the driver an excellent seating position and a reasonable set of tools to help enjoy it. The steering wheel doesn't telescope. However, I think this car doesn't particularly need it, and it does have a tilt adjustment standard in even the base model DX. Also standard and very Honda appropriate was the true and proper dead pedal for the driver's left foot. In this car, the driver also gets an EX-specific treat, this right-hand armrest. A well-done, driver-oriented instrument cluster rises up from the very low dashboard. At the center of that dashboard, you'll find a digital clock recessed toward the windshield, another period Honda trademark. The cockpit of this Accord is a great size. Space is ample, but all of the controls still fall very closely and easily to hand. Rear seat space does trail other proper midsize cars, though. The seat is very well-shaped and well-padded, the big windows are nice, and a pair of adults can fit back here, but it's relatively snug. From the driver's seat, the low hood and big windshield give the driver a clear, commanding view that is particularly refreshing in this day and age. But once you drop the firmly spring-loaded gear selector into drive and start moving, you realize there is more to the front end of this car than just a good view. If you're used to rear-wheel drive cars, most front-wheel drive cars feel a little unnatural, with the entire powertrain and driveline hanging heavily over the front axle. But this car does not give you that same sensation. Its front end does not feel big. It does not feel bulbous. It does not feel heavy. The Accord feels balanced, and it sits on the road nicely. From a stop, the Accord has good torque, and you can tell that it was tuned for good low-end thrust. Peak torque and redline come at a modest 4,500 and 6,200 RPM respectively, and although it's not fast by modern standards, only the fastest of its V6 competitors could out-hustle an Accord EX. This engine has a relatively wide power band across a very usable range, and power always feels good whether accelerating gently or kicking down a gear to pass. It doesn't have that motorcycle feel like some sportier Hondas that beg to be revved high to make power. The automatic transmission tends to hold gears relatively long, a good fit for the car, and shifts are very firm. A bit jarring, but this does tend to yield better transmission longevity. Through turns, there is a moderate amount of body lean and some understeer by design, but this was still the driver's car of its class, with good agility and responsiveness due to its fundamentally strong chassis. Factory tuning, from the powertrain to the suspension, emphasizes smoothness over outright performance. But the suspension's components, like shocks, springs, and bushings, are readily upgradable to stiffer stock. And the engine and transmission are easily swapped with a variety of other Honda units. Hondas like this one are a clean slate for relatively easy, inexpensive, and effective mechanical upgrades, and were largely responsible for the emergence of the tuner scene. With a stiffer suspension, manual transmission, and perhaps even a hotter engine, these cars could be downright fun to drive. But left stock, this car offers a ride that is both controlled and compliant, the best of both worlds. Going down the highway at 75 miles per hour was an eye-opener. It feels as stable as you would expect a bigger, more expensive car to feel at speed. But this is still that same car that felt so refreshingly maneuverable around the parking lot. Driving this car down the road, it all starts to make perfect sense. This is a front-wheel drive car, but it's not hurting to be rear-wheel drive. This is a four-cylinder car, but it's not hurting for a V6, because it came from a company that wasn't distracted with any of that stuff. It's all starting to come together now. If you scale back, and you don't have excess size, and you don't have excess weight, then you don't need a ton of torque, and you don't need a big engine with its extra size and weight. Now, you've created a positive feedback loop, and Honda took advantage of it. They dropped an over-engineered, lightweight 4 into an over-engineered, lightweight chassis made just for it. The result was an icon. Coveted by everyone, from grandmothers to tuners, this car won a big, important, lucrative popularity contest in America. And it did so in the way that popularity is typically won. Not by trying to be everything to everybody but by being the best version of itself. As for me, the CB will always strike a particular chord. After all, this was the best-selling car of the year I was born, and they fill my earliest memories. But here's what really made an impression on me. When I was a kid, 
my uncle was a mechanic at the local Infinity dealership. For years, he and my aunt drove nearly identical cars. They were parked side by side in the garage. One light brown, one dark brown. They were CB7 Accords, LX sedans. I was young enough to be highly impressionable, but aware enough to realize this. If the guy who works on cars for a living owns two of these, there must be something to them.